Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, we're going about to talk about a market that continues to push forward. A lot of question marks coming into this week after last week about the stability of the market, the potential for further upside with so much uncertainty. I feel like those questions have been answered with the market continuing to push higher Thursday into Friday session. This may have been the most resilient of them all with the S&P closing above 3476, not too far away from all time highs. Once again, we'll look at that and more. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close to look at the markets together through the lenses of technical analysis, behavioral finance, quantitative methods, investor psychology, sentiment, breadth, anything we can to try to get a read on things and make sense of an uncertain environment. Uh, you know, as, we, as I mentioned in the introduction, you know, it's, I've certainly raised plenty of questions over the last many months about the potential for further upside. And, and, and I would say in an environment when markets move higher, I would, I would usually classify myself at the most optimistic as a hesitant or a cautious bull because I have, uh, I, and, and part of that is probably learning technical analysis during a pretty destructive period in the early 2000s. So, uh, you know, I'm always looking for chinks in the armor for potential for downside risk, for upside exhaustion, all those things that would tell me that the party's about to be over and just start to, you know, check uh, for, for potential downside. You know, what I've seen in the last week and maybe the week before started it, but what I've really seen the follow through through um, today's session is really the resiliency of, uh, of individual names uh, emerging out of bases. We're going to look at a lot of that together. I do want to highlight some of the upcoming guests. We had some really great guests uh, this week. Uh, uh, Jay Hatfield earlier in the week, we had JC Peretz, uh, yesterday, Willie Delwich on Wednesday, some really thoughtful uh, money managers, strategists sharing their their points of view. Next week, more of the same. We have Jeff Weiss from Clearview Trading Advisors joining us on Tuesday. On Wednesday, Mark Newton from uh, Newton Advisors uh, joining the show as well. Coming up on Monday, November 19th, we have a special event, a presidential cycle panel. Uh, I've talked with many strategists over the years, guys like Tom McClellan and Bruce Frazier and Jeff Hirsch. Uh, about the presidential cycle, you know, part of a larger conversation about seasonal trends for sure, but really focusing on that four-year cycle, what we should expect during an election year, what's the base case, what tends to happen in different election outcomes. And what's really cool is we combine those three into a panel. I'll be moderating a conversation with the three of them coming up on uh, Monday, October 19th, just picking their brain on how to approach the uh, presidential cycle given the current environment and what the trends have told us. So it, it's going to be a really uh, actionable, uh, I think, important discussion leading into uh, obviously a fairly contentious election here in the United States. We're getting back to uh, to the uh, to the show here, we're going to wrap the week, and, and what we do on Fridays is is what we call wrap the week, which is basically look at the last five trading sessions from Friday to Friday. How much has changed according to that big picture uh, uh, period, and 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 what are the long term trends telling us? How can we update? The long-term trends for today, and we usually do a couple different things. First, we're just going to do a quick touch on the uh, on the markets in case you missed going into the close where things are at. Hit on some themes there. We're going to look at the weekly returns for how these major asset classes have evolved week to week, and then we're going to get to the Mindful Investor Live chart list, which is our rundown of some of the key charts that we review every week. Same set of charts. Starting with the market today, S and P closing up 0.9 percent almost to 34.77. So it's a you know a nice. A nice up move. And again, we're sort of processing these closes as we record it. So um, things jump, maybe jumping around just a, a, a touch or so, but, uh, but overall a pretty decent up move and a continuation of what we saw on Thursday where we finished at the highs of the day. Mid caps and small caps up as well. Not up as much though. So this was more of the large cap uh, trade really uh, moving it forward. And technology was the number one sector followed by consumer discretionary. So we're sort of back to the average day, I feel, that sort of got us here, which was an uptrend 
big cap tech and consumer leading the way on the downside. You have things like energy, real estate, utilities, financials. It's sort of what the picture looked like for, for quite a while, I think, for, for many uh, days during the, the months leading up to the September high. So a bit of uh, back to, to normal, I guess. The VIX back below uh, 25 now again. Looking at other asset classes, the dollar's actually weak and it came off uh, pretty good with the UUP down 0.6%. That uptrend that we've had in the dollar, the strong dollar environment, really has rotated lower. And this is at a time when small caps overall have been performing relatively well uh, compared to the large cap index. That's a bit of a, of a head scratcher of sorts. The bond uh, market essentially finishing flat came off really uh, heavily in the mid, uh, midday, but came back to uh, the TLT finishing flat for the day. Yields a little bit higher. On the commodity side, oil weaker today, and that's obviously uh, you know main reason why energy is down. Gold and silver actually uh, pretty strong to the upside with silver ETF up about five and a half percent. We're going to look at that chart uh, in a little bit, especially the uh, the gold trade. Those precious metals came off you know sort of before stocks did, and now are all really breaking out of. Uh, of nice support zones. So, uh, so overall, potentially resuming that long-term uptrend as well. And just you can see today's trading in silver was essentially just uh, resilient from the beginning. One of these, I think it's this one, is the uh, is the intermarket chart. I'm going to refresh this. There we go. So this is going through about at the uh, the close. We're looking at just some major asset classes, key indexes to pay attention to. Here's the S&P 500 in black. The labels are off just a, a touch, but the s and is here in black. And it was up uh, 3.8%, 3.9% for the week, starting the clock on the last Friday's close. Very close to that were a cluster of things. This is why the labels are kind of jumbled up. Here we have the NASDAQ just above 4%. Emerging markets almost the same, and Bitcoin up 4.5%. Two of the indexes we follow outperformed uh, stocks in a uh, more significant way this week with small caps up 6.4%. And that relative strength of small caps is the thing we've talked about. I think that's an important one to pay attention to. We've all gotten very comfortable with the idea of small caps underperforming because it's been happening for years and years. However, we're starting to see signs of that really starting to uh, starting to change with small caps flourishing on a relative basis. And this week was a, was certainly an exclamation point to that new trend. Crude oil came off today, but overall up almost 9%. That was the top uh, performer out of all of these major uh, indexes we're following. Underperforming stocks this week, we have gold only up 1.4%, so still positive. That all really came uh, today. Uh, as of yesterday, it was down for the week, uh, but really uh, rallied with the precious metal trade uh, today. The dollar weaker, 0.9% for the week. And if you look at the bond markets, that was the worst performer of all of them, down 1.6%. So that stock to bond ratio, we look at the SPY versus the TLT. It's in our Mindful Investor Live chart list. I don't know if we'll get all the way to that point. But that is certainly, uh, you know, continuing to lean into stocks over bonds and weeks like this are what continue to make that ratio go higher. Let's continue on our wrap the week uh, adventure by going here to the Mindful Investor Live chart list. Again, if you've not watched the show on a Friday before, we use the same chart list every week. It's to hopefully reinforce to you one of the things I think is most important for active investors, for financial advisors, institutional investors, have a set routine of things that you look at and do the same way every morning, every week, uh, every month, every quarter, whatever time frame is relevant for you. And so this is a piece of my weekly routine that I use every week. And it starts on a Thursday, it finishes on a Monday, and it goes through the same steps every week. And, and I would attribute any, any awareness I've had of market activity has probably most likely come from the consistent review of a consistent group of, uh, of charts. I'd encourage you to explore the same. If you, have, you don't have this, go to uh, the articles page, go to the Mindful Investor, which is my uh, uh, page here on stock charts, and click on the very top. There's a link to this chart list. You can save it to your login. Chart number one is the S&P market trend, and it's remained positive pretty much on all three time frames. This starts with a long-term trend, which is based on the 21 and 34 week exponential moving averages. This turned positive uh, a while ago back here in June, has remained positive uh, through today. And, and, and it would take a lot of uh, deterioration to turn that anywhere near negative. Uh, it's been positive for most of the last five years, as you can, uh, as you can see here, and, and rightfully so. That's been the, uh, certainly the overarching trend in the, uh, in the market. The medium term trend is based on the weekly PPO, which is uh, very similar to the weekly MACD. And it's a traditional, uh, you know, settings, traditional look at that medium term trend for me. Uh, this came very close to turning negative over the last couple of weeks and has not done so. So the, the lines have not actually crossed 
it's remained positive. So for me, that medium term has remained positive. And what this basically illustrates is this pullback that we saw uh, sort of, uh, you know, early September to mid-September was a pullback within a longer term period of strength. And that would change if we, you know, start to rotate a little bit lower, start to break some key support, and this uh, this this line, uh, this indicator would turn negative. Short term is usually done on the daily chart for me, but as a placeholder on the weekly chart, I have this one, which is just looking at the price relative to its five-week exponential moving average that's been positive for the last couple weeks, and uh, essentially long-term, medium-term, short-term, all thumbs up at the moment. You know, the daily chart of the S&P has been a great exercise, in my opinion, on the value of support and resistance levels. And the, the point of the name of this show, which is the final bar, when I teach technical analysis to new analysts, to new investors, I always tell them, start with the final bar, start with the current bar here, and then look to the left and, and identify key levels to pay attention to. One of the steps on my checklist involves you know, the current price relative to key support and resistance. And, you know, if you did that, you would have noticed the importance of this congestion area from uh, mid-August, which was the first step down after the peak in uh, early September. You also would have noticed this level from uh, early June, which was reiterated a number of times in the month of July. It's highlighted here in this blue shaded area, and that's right where we pulled back to. We never got down through that. So that area of support, I think, uh, held and is even further validated if and when we get some downturn, which at some point we will, I will be looking at these key levels again. Here, the 50-day moving average in this congestion zone uh, from before around 3350 to 3400, and then uh, even more so here, 3200 to 3250, which has proven to be a, a, a key level to pay attention to. You know, it's interesting to note just one other anecdote. The RSI is just above 60, and in bullish phases, the RSI doesn't tend to get too much below 40 and it tends to become overbought on upswings. In bear phases, the RSI tends to get oversold and doesn't tend to get above 60. So pushing above 60 right about here going into next week would be one more data point sort of fulfilling this bullish reversal that we've seen. This is a series of breadth indicators, cumulative advanced decline lines based on a number of different universes of, uh, of U.S. equities. Here's the S&P closing values. You can see this is color coded based on where I'm seeing the trend. Two of these, the S&P advanced decline line and the mid cap advanced decline line have now broken above their peaks from uh, August and a uh, similar peak in September here for the S&P. So both of those at all at new time, uh, new highs, excuse me, uh, for this run and both confirming uh, a very bullish configuration. So that's telling because, you know, anecdotally uh, myself and others at times have talked about, you know, Amazon and Alphabet and Facebook and, uh, you know, these small number of mega cap stocks that are pushing the market higher. These breadth lines making new highs tell you that's not the whole story, that there are plenty of names and plenty of cap tiers that are able to uh, managing to get to, uh, to new highs. And, and that's what that's telling you. Not quite an all clear for the small cap index or the common stock only index. These aren't updated for today's close just yet for Friday. So I would assume based what on what I'm seeing in the characteristics, I would expect both of these to turn uh, positive. And when I review them again over the weekend, I'll most likely flip them all green. One of the key parts of, uh, of I think, a skeptical thesis here in, uh, in, in mid-September was the anemic number of uh, new highs, right? If the market is in decent shape, you have a, at least some number, a meaningful number of stocks making new highs. So even though the S&P is not at all-time highs, other stocks should be, right? Stocks like Home Builders and Procter and & Gamble and, and many other names uh, FedEx, other stocks that we've reviewed as a, you know, together on the show in recent weeks, you need more and more of those because, you know, in before the S&P makes high, new highs, you will have individual stocks that are able to do it. What this week has shown me is that we're starting to get traction along those lines. And I think one of the most encouraging things I've seen is a consistent number of stocks making new 52-week highs. Again, this isn't updated quite for today, but as of yesterday's close, you had 12% of the S&P making a new 52-week high uh, on Thursday, which is pretty good. That's probably going to go up today. Uh, looking at stocks relative to their moving average is always a key part here. Um, you know, over 50% on both sides, and, and, and that speaks to, the again, the underlying strength uh, behind this uh, this current upswing. Now over 70% of the S&P above their 200-day moving average. That's good. I'm not worried about the fact that that's too high because you will see plenty of times like here in uh, you know late 2019 
you became uh, over 70% and it remained up there for, you know, four or five months. So just because it's above there does not suggest, you know, it's exhaustion and we're going to come down. In a healthy uptrend, these sort of breath readings will, will become elevated and remain elevated for uh, serious parts of uh, um, excuse me, long periods of time. What I would look for is if you do start to get new highs and those new highs are not confirmed by the breath measures, that's when you can start to be a little more concerned. In terms of the AAII survey, it's worth pointing out that this actually narrowed. This came out on Thursday and it's not, you know, again, sentiment is sort of third on my list after price and breath, but I always pay attention to things like this. It is, it is close to tilting net positive, net bullish for the first time since February. In longer bull market phases, this uh, ratio, the, the difference between these two, it leans more bulls, bulls over bears, and it tends to be for longer period of times, you know, going up to a, a market peak. There's been none of that in the last uh, six to seven months after the February, uh, February peak. That's certainly one thing that would be uh, telling is if you finally turn positive, I don't see that as uh, necessarily a negative. I see that as a recognition of further upside at this point. Number of ratio charts, we don't have time to go through all of these, but again, when people talk about consumer discretionary and tell me it's all Amazon, I point to this, which is the equal weighted ratio or the equal weighted ETFs, consumer discretionary versus consumer staples, making a new swing high for the last uh, six months. So overall, it's telling you it's not just Amazon, it's, uh, it's other things as well. Semiconductors blowing out to new relative highs again this week. That consistent pattern is going to be one of those catalysts that I think continues to uh, push the market higher. Having said that, where we'll finish is this chart, which is small caps versus large caps, the IWM versus the SPY, back above the 200-day moving average for the first time in a couple years, which is a very meaningful change. If we're able to break that ratio above the June peak, which was back here, that would be a huge rotation more to the upside, speaking to the benefits of digging down in the, uh, in the smaller companies that you may have uh, mentally written off because of the dominance of the mega cap trade. Small cap trade, I think based on this, uh, if not completely back, is back enough to warrant some, uh, some attention. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Appreciate you joining us on the show every weekday after the close to make sense of these markets together. As a reminder, we're going to do another mailbag segment here in a moment. You can get your questions to us three ways. One is via email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. Second way is on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. And the third way is on our YouTube channel. Just put a comment below any of the videos that we're watching. We'll capture all of those and hopefully answer one of your questions uh, on the air. I want to get to our next segment, the final bar mailbag. As I mentioned just moments ago, we, uh, these are all questions that we received from you. These are all in the last 24 to 48 hours. We appreciate all the questions that you're sending in. We can't get to all of them, but we'll do our best to get through as many of them as we can. Question number one, um, can you send me the settings for this chart and explain how you set it up, which was uh, this one. And as I've promised you before, if you ever see me use a chart on here and you're not quite sure what I did, just shoot me an email, the final bar at stockcharts.com. I can send you a permalink. So right below all of the charts on Sharp Charts, on the main uh, Stock Charts platform, there's this little thing that says permalink. In our new ACP platform, there's a link, uh, there's, a, there's a button to send a link uh, similar fashion. It's just in a different place on the top of the chart. But permalink basically gives you this little, uh, you know, shortened URL. Uh, I can email that to you. You can open it up in your browser, save it right to your login. So I'm more than happy to share anything that I'm showing uh, on the show here. But I also want you to understand how to set these up because the better you know the platform, the better you're going to be able to create your own really cool visualizations. Hopefully show me if you come up with something really awesome um, so that I can use it too. Uh, but this is a really uh, great visualization. With breadth indicators, there's a lot of really cool tricks you can do um, to show different different things. This is one where I'm basically looking at advancers on the NYSE as a, uh, as a percentage of total listings and also decliners as a percentage of total listings. So what percent of NYSE listings are up on the day? What percent are down on the day. The way I did that is below uh, the chart on the indicator section, you have a, an indicator called price. And then you basically just do the two tickers separated by a colon. So that's dollar sign uh, NYADV colon dollar sign NYTOT. And those are the tickers uh, for those uh, individual ones. 
You can find the tickers for breadth indicators like that by just using the, uh, the search bar. You can also hit the little magnifying glass. That's probably the best way I would recommend doing it. Um, you also, again, I, one of the ways that I learned how to use the platform is just watch what people are doing on, on Stock Charts TV. The hosts use the, the platform even better than I do. Some of my, my uh, co-hosts on, on, the, uh, on the channel, but uh, again, I'm sure they'll be, they'll be happy to share with you some of the charts that they're using. Uh, the other good thing to do, and, and I don't really use it here, but you can also do price up, down, pair. And that's really good for like AAII survey where you have a bullish reading and a bearish reading and you want to show them above and below the same zero line. That's the way that you, uh, that you do that. So that's the way that I created that chart. And thanks for the question. Question number two, what's the difference between dollar sign SPXEW and ticker RSP? Um, you also mentioned, I, I called myself a nervous bull and you said, I think being a nervous bull is, a, is good for managing risk. And I would totally, I would totally agree with you. You know, when I was at, uh, at Fidelity at a large buy side institution, we had a, you know, a, a team of, uh, of analysts that would always be comparing notes and, and we would always have someone play the devil's advocate role. And just sort of, if we all felt like we were on one side of a, of an opinion of a trade of a recommendation, someone would have to argue the other side of it. And it was illuminating at times just to expose ourselves to an opposing point of view. And so I've taken that to heart when I'm looking at charts, always looking for what would tell me that I'm wrong. You know, what would I need to see to reverse my decision to, to get out of a position and, and so forth. I would encourage you to uh, approach anything with a, with a healthy, healthy dose of skepticism. So the answer to your question, dollar sign SPXEW is the S&P equal weighted uh, index. So just like dollar sign SPX, that's dollar sign SPXEW for equal weight. So it's, it's an equal weighted index. And that's just the, you know, the way that you calculate the index. So the normal S&P is cap weighted, meaning larger companies, but measured by market cap are a larger weight. The equal weighted index just weights all 500 companies in an identical way. So it, you know, sort of eliminates the mega cap overweight or, or uh, over overweight that you have in, uh, in traditional indexes. The RSP is simply the ETF based on that index. So just like I'm using the SPY, uh, the S&P 500 ETF to look at the S&P 500, I'm using RSP as the equal weighted ETF. So that's actually a, you know, a tradable ETF. You could buy or sell that as you would any other ETF. So I, I use the ETFs more often than not, mainly for transparency and the data is consistent. They're liquid. Um, most people can access them regardless of what platform you use. And uh, that's why I pay attention to them. Thanks for that question. Next question, does it concern you that the market has been going up on light volume? Well, with my healthy dose of skepticism comments that I just made a little bit ago, uh, of course it does. I'm always looking for things that would uh, refute the, uh, the conclusion that I have. I, you know, I, overall, again, I still think that the market is in, in good shape uh, based on the evidence that I've, I've told you. And you know, as we've talked about, for me, the, 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 the analysis of the macro environment has three phases, you know, three pieces. It starts with price. And so regardless of anything else, the best thing you can do to analyze the trend in the S&P 500 is a chart of the S&P 500 and look at the price and make a conclusion based on traditional technical principles. After that, you have a bunch of ways to try and qualify that or confirm or not confirm what you see with price. And that's where breadth comes in for me. And I sort of bucket volume in there with breadth, uh, although you could argue it's maybe more of a sentiment read, but I tend to sort of group it with breadth indicators. So, you know, advancers, decliners, the McClellan oscillator, which is sort of a derivative of that, on balance volume, um, check and money flow, uh, just pure volume analysis, that all sort of validates the characteristics of the companies that make up those indexes and what they can tell you. And then third to that is sentiment, things like survey data and positioning and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, when I'm looking at this chart, this is the S&P 500, this is the uh, volume indicator. And again, you could look at many different ways to try and do it. And then this is on balance volume at the, uh, at the bottom. You know, concerning things would be if the price is doing one thing and the on balance volume is not confirming that. Uh, we really haven't seen that. The on balance volume has moved uh, essentially in, in, in lockstep with it. So price has not quite made a new high. On balance volume has not quite, quite made a new high. You might be able to argue that the on balance volume is not broken above that swing high just yet, maybe. Um, but overall, that, that doesn't concern me a ton yet. Um, I think you're referring most likely to this, which is just the, you know, the volume is certainly trending down where you saw the volume accelerate into the market high in, in August. You can see the volume trend overall kind of weakening. The, the challenge I have with that is that there are plenty of times when the market has rallied. The volume trend has not been super impressive relative to higher volume times. 
uh, and maybe back here in, uh, in 2019, you can see some examples of that. You know, for me, volume has become less and less of a, of a concern because I've seen so many times when the market can rally on, uh, on lighter volume. Um, so having said that, it, it's less of a concern for me. I, I get it. And when I look at all of the evidence and, and think of the mosaic, the lighter volume is certainly in the negative column, but I think the positives certainly vastly outweigh that, particularly other measures of breadth. Final question, and then we need to wrap the show. Uh, let's see. On my sixth, I want to ask you questions about moving averages, specifically for hourly, daily, weekly, and monthly charts. On my hourly chart, it has a time frame of one month. I've configured my moving averages to 50 and 200. For the daily chart, I have uh, 20, 50, and 200. My weekly chart, I have 10 and 50. My monthly chart, 10 and 20 months. Can you confirm if these settings are the correct ones or do you recommend some others? So my first answer to the question is, I'm sorry to tell you that there are no, you know, quote unquote, correct ones. And I can tell you what is more popular. I can tell you what I think makes more sense um, based on what you are trying to do. And I think that's what you want to you wanna try to focus on. What question are you trying to answer by looking at the chart? It's all about your time frame. It's all about what game you're trying to win. And then you can determine which moving averages uh, relate to those. Having said that, when you look at your daily chart and you have the 20, 50, and 200, I think those are totally, uh, totally fine. I've, I've, I've debated with Grayson Rose on the, uh, on the stock charts team about that. He looks at the 425, which is sort of like a, you know, two year ish kind of, kind of uh, moving average. Um, you know, I, the uh, general idea when you look at 250 is sort of a year and then a quarter, I think is the general rounding error sort of way you do that. Although there's usually about 260 trading days in a year. Um, but overall, the 50 and 200 are the most commonly used out of any moving average combination I've ever seen. I've spent a lot of time with people that are not big chart people, but have a chart and look at it. And they are aware when the, when the price hits a 50-day or a 200-day moving average on the daily chart. So for that question alone, I think it's very much worth uh, doing that. And then for me, the 20-day is just sort of a, you know, a short-term swing, telling you a little bit more about the price relative to the 50-day moving average. And I have no problem with that. On the weekly chart, my only suggestion is you're using the 10-week moving average, which makes sense to me because that's almost identical to the 50 day. You're also using the 50 week. And I would say if you make that the 40 week, then that will line up uh, very much to the 200 day moving average because 200 divided by five for five days in the week. And that's your 40. So I actually use 10 and 40 on my weekly charts. And I usually do like 150 week for a much longer term uh, view. And then the, uh, the 10 is the same that I would use on the weekly chart. So having said that, the answer to that question is really what makes sense for you based on the types of instruments you're using and the timeframes, but especially on the daily and weekly, hopefully that gives you a sense of some of the more commonly used settings and why they are. That is our mailbag for today. We need to wrap the show quickly and go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is gold, ticker GLD. This is the gold ETF. Wanted to point out we have now established a higher low and now uh, breaking to a new swing high today with the GLD back above 180. This is one of those key lines we talked about. This is the Fibonacci resistance level. Uh, and uh, earlier in the week, Monday to Tuesday, you had this bearish engulfing pattern. We really didn't follow through much further down. It quickly reversed and now has reverted back to a new swing high. So overall, I see this as the beginning of further upside for the, uh, for the GLD, for silver as well. I see both of those rotating more positive and I like the long-term trend in, uh, in both of those charts. Number two is the S&P with new highs and lows. Since we started recording the show, we've gotten the updated uh, new highs on the S&P 78, which means uh, you know that's actually a pretty, that's 15% of the S&P making a new 52-week uh, high today. That's pretty good, that's a, that's a decent number. Um, and, uh, and one of the highest readings we've had in the last uh, six months, really. One of the things we've talked about is the need for indicators like this to increase, to improve steadily over time, which shows you more and more stocks able to break to new highs and, and, and get above its August or September high, which the S&P has un, been unable to do just yet. That is a pattern that I'm, uh, that I'm seeing that I'm pretty, uh, pretty impressed with. The more that we see that going into next week and beyond, the more optimistic I will want to feel about uh, the potential for further upside. And as I've mentioned before, I think S&P 3600 is very reasonable and attainable in the near future here. Finally, is the semiconductors ETF on our, uh, on our Mindful Investor Live chart list. We just look at the ratio of the two, but I think the chart itself shows the story. We have a new 52-week closing high for the SMH today, uh, which is pretty impressive, making new price highs along with many other uh, stocks and ETFs. The relative strength is the real story, and I love the resiliency uh, resilience of that uh, relative strength line. Folks, that is our show, and that's a wrap for this week. 
on the final bar. I hope you can join us all next week on Monday's show. We hit the market from three directions, top down, second rotation, bottom up. It's worth, uh, worth watching. For StockCharts.com and Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.